Actually, I think I'll just go ahead and get started. How about that? We'll start a little bit early. Maybe we'll get done early. Who knows? So <laughs> thanks, everyone. Uh, you know, I'm Audrey. Thanks for attending my session, Threat Modeling Star Wars Edition. So you know, just a little bit about me. Um, I work at Microsoft. I'm a senior security software engineer. Uh, I've got my master's degree from Johns Hopkins University in cybersecurity. Uh, before that, I got my undergrad in University of Cincinnati in computer science. I like to do a whole bunch of really nerdy things. So if you guys also you know like to play games, tinker, actually 3D print and paint stuff, you know, talk to me. We have a lot to say. We have a lot to talk about. All right, so today we're gonna get, have our deep dive session today in the wonderful world of threat modeling. So we will leave today's talk with new perspectives and learnings. And by the end of the session, hopefully we will obtain a security mindset, gain some threat modeling fundamentals, walk through the steps to generate threat models and threat model the Death Star, as well as gain some really fun, nerdy security knowledge as well. All right, so before we kind of get into the, the meat of the talk, let's do a high level, level over overview of what threat modeling is. So threat modeling works to identify, communicate, and understand threats and mitigations within the context of protecting something of value. A threat model is a structured representation of all the information that affects the security of an application or the system. In essence, it's a view of the system and its environment through the lens of security. Threat modeling can be applied to a wide range of things, including software applications, systems, networks, distributed systems, Internet of Things devices, your refrigerator, and in this case, we're gonna do the threat, uh, threat modeling, the Death Star. All right, so who should be threat modeling? So really, anyone could threat model, but what I typically see is software engineers, security engineers, architects, program and technical program managers, software testers. Basically, if you have an understanding of how your system functions, then you can make a threat model. So when should we use threat modeling? So threat modeling is best performed during design sessions, and that's when it's really the easiest to make changes. It's much less costly than adding mitigations and testing them after your solution has already been implemented. Using threat modeling whenever you design new systems or if you're updating existing ones um, can be really beneficial for you in the long run. Some examples of threat modeling includes creating like a new microservice or a new cloud application, designing a public API to provide customers access to your data, adding a new feature to an existing application, or completely creating some new kind of infrastructure project. However, the list really does go on. It doesn't just stop there. Now, what is a security mindset? So security requires a particular mindset. I'm sure everyone here at B-Sides definitely knows what I'm talking about here. Good security professionals see the world differently. We can't just walk into a store without noticing how to shoplift. We can't use a computer without wondering about all the security vulnerabilities that lie within it. We can't vote without thinking about, hey, how can we vote twice? You know, we just can't help it. And this type of thinking is not natural for most people. It's not natural for engineers. Good engineering involves thinking about how things can be made to work. The security mindset involves thinking about how things can be made to fail. It involves thinking like an attacker, an adversary, or a criminal, however you'd like to classify that. Uh, you don't have to exploit the vulnerabilities you find, but if you see the world in that way, that's the only way you'll ever find security problems. And by adopting a security mindset, you can emphasize the attacker, their motive, means, and all the ways they can wreak havoc in your system. This approach looks at all entry points and system weaknesses and allows you to focus on critical assets, holding the highly confidential data for your system. And when those weaknesses are discovered, emphasis is placed on protecting those assets instead of the entire system or whatever your scope may be for a threat modeling exercise. Now, I'm not gonna go over a classical threat modeling perspective for you today. However, I think it's kind of interesting to see. Um, this is what a threat model looks like in the DOD, which is probably the most you know, rigorous way to actually create threat models. And I actually did a threat model on uh, 
the uranium centrifuge systems, you know, Stuxnet, that's probably something that we've all heard of before. And I can tell you that this is a very, very long process. However, you know, when we do threat modeling in cloud applications or a lot of applications today, we won't really go through a big, long process like this. Instead, we kind of look at threat modeling in a very small and comprehensive phase. So this is the core algorithm for developing threat models within any kind of a commercial industry. And with a condensed version of the classical model, really anything can be pulled from the classical model to be thrown into the more condensed version. Um, it really just depends on your system, your requirements, and how thorough you really need to be when creating some of these threat models. Now let's go with over these phases one step at a time, and then we'll apply those phases to threat model the Death Star. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze the existing system. And this is really known as like the design phase. The design phase is a starting ground for your threat modeling activities. You'll gather as much data as possible about what you're building and how you can you know, gather any kind of information about the system at hand. So some of the high level goals when we're analyzing an existing system include developing a clear picture on how your system nominally functions. You wanna enumerate services consumed in your system, investigate environmental assumptions and security controls. You wanna gather some of those system design requirements and architectures, and really want to identify some of the key stakeholders who you're gonna be talking to. Now, the second phase in the condensed threat modeling uh, version is to design a data flow diagram. So D a data flow diagram, otherwise known as a DFD, is a visual representation of how any process or system flow of information comes in and out of your system. By mapping out your processes or system flow of data, DFDs help you better understand the processes of the system, uncover its kinks, improve it, and can even help implement a new process or system. Some of the high-level goals when designing data flow diagrams include to understand the user and system scenarios, establish trust zones and boundaries within your system, identify user permissions used throughout the system lifecycle, and investigate protocols being used inside and outside of the system being designed. Here you can see some of the data flow diagram elements. So these are pretty much a, a classic representation. Uh, anytime you make a DFD, it's really common to use these, these models and these uh, designs. Uh, because each interaction here is really there to help you analyze and identify potential threats and ways to reduce risk within your system. Using these shapes correctly also helps you receive better input from colleagues and security teams. Everyone will pretty much understand how the system works if you map it out correctly, and it can help everyone avoid going through all the countless design documents and development plans to help them getting up and running. The third phase is to identify threats. This phase is where you use the data flow diagram to find potential threats against your system. We will use a threat modeling framework to help find the most common threats and ways to protect against them. A threat modeling framework is essentially a series of rules and guidance associated around teasing out threats within a system or an environment. Threat modeling is a great technique to help you find issues early in the development lifecycle, and choosing the right focused approach helps you tailor to the threat modeling exercise. You'll find more actionable threats and ways to solve against them. So you can see, I just kind of selected a handful of Yaman threat modeling frameworks that I've used and are used commonly within our industry. You know, since I'm a Microsofty, I have to say we use Stride, and when we threat model the Death Star here later, we're going to also be applying the Stride framework to help find some kind of threats and identify some mitigation candidates against those. So some high-level goals when you're actually trying to identify threats include to actually apply your security mindset. Uh, we want to try to find any of those openings within our system. Choose whether or not you want to find ways to protect your system or if you want to understand all you can about an attacker and their motives. Use the data flow diagrams to find potential threats against your system. 
apply the threat modeling frameworks, and identify system weaknesses. Here is another high level, level overview of some common threat modeling frameworks that I use a lot in the application security space uh, with cloud applications. Um, so here you can see the Stride threat modeling framework. Um, you know, OWASP top 10 is another really popular one. And MITRE ATT&CK. These frameworks I use quite often. However, you know, depending on your system, these might not work for you. So you can't just shoehorn everything into one specific threat modeling framework. You need to be dynamic. All right, the next goal is to brainstorm those mitigation strategies. This phase is where the fate of all threats is decided. Each threat modeling framework should map to security controls within your environment, which often which offer different functions and types to choose from generally. Once mitigation candidates are created, assigning a criticality or a weight to each of one to determine which mitigations need to be implemented right away and also to decide what the complexity and time to fix each mitigation candidate. Some of the high level goals when brainstorming against mitigation strategies include measuring each threat against a prioritization framework or a security bug bar, track each threat as a task or a work item in a backlog, generate security control recommendations that are mapped to threat modeling frameworks, and select one or more security control types and functions to address each threat. Ensuring we map an accurate framework is pretty, you know, it's, it's probably one of the, the, the high level things that you need to do in, when regarding creating some of those mitigation strategies. Here you can see how you can map stride with your DFDs. And I, I follow this map pretty closely, and I feel like it helps me identify some of those best mitigations depending on what kind of applications I'm looking at. All right, and last but not least, you wanna continuously iterate and verify. This is the last step of the threat modeling process, which often happens before the system is deployed we all know that's not true. Uh, this is like the best case scenario. A lot of the times uh, people actually have to go back and threat model existing systems. However, always ensuring that you're continuously iterating and continuously verifying your DFDs, your threat maps, and any other kind of architecture that comes hand in hand with creating threat models is really important. Um, so, you know, some of the high level goals here are to confirm all previous and new security requirements are satisfied for the system. Configure cloud providers, operating systems, and components to meet security requirements. Ensure all issues are addressed with the right security controls. And take the system through manual and automated verification before deployment. Now, you can threat model anything. So, you know, I know you guys are all here for this session because we are going to deep dive into threat modeling the Death Star. And we're going to use all the phases that we just discussed and show you how we can actually map that together. So step one was to analyze the existing system. According to the US government, and no really, the US government actually did this. The first Death Star would have cost at least 852 quadrillion US dollars to construct. The Death Star took 20 years to build, and because of its sheer size and complexity, that takes a lot of time and money. And as we all know, working in big companies, it's also a lot of time and a lot of money, and we need to make sure that what we're building is secure. And the Death Star, you know, as we know, is a very complex piece of machinery, which contains very intricate services which rely on each other to achieve total destruction and induce fear throughout the galaxy. The Death Star main purpose is to function as a mobile platform for its main weapon, the super laser. The Death Star's structure is basically an enormous housing for the super laser and the reactor that empowers it. At a high level, the Death Star is made of four major components. The battle station, the super laser, the propulsion system, and the hypermatter reactor that powers it all. So just a really high level overview, you know, the battle station, that's where we're going to input our commands to move or do anything with the Death Star itself. The super laser is a massive lens built around a huge synthetic focusing crystal, obviously, and is surrounded by eight trebuchet lasers. 
The propulsion system is the Death Star's real space propulsion system, and it's made of a network of ion engines that converts and transforms reactors to power that into thrust. The engine thrusters are primarily lined along the equator of the station. And last but not least, the hypermatter reactor. The greatest challenge in designing a Death Star was not creating a cannon big enough to fire a beam that can destroy a planet, nor was it creating a battle station the size of a small moon. The greatest challenge was always powering a cannon big enough to fire a beam that could destroy a planet and moving a battle station the size of a small moon. Now, the next step is to actually design a data flow diagram. As you can see here, I, I did this one by hand, and it's really fun to kind of see all of the different research that had to go into what needed to, what commands needed to go in to actually do any kind of functionality within the Death Star. Uh, so a lot of these are actually used in this command station computer. Um, so a lot of the, the times the Imperial, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's too funny. <laughs> An Imperial user has to actually input a command into this computer to either, you know, re reform the laser, point it to a, a planet that you would like to destroy, to put up the defensive shields, to move the battle station, to make sure that our, you know, our lasers are, you know, functional, and to make sure that that tractor beam is really up and operational. Now, now that we have our data flow diagram, let's just kind of at a really high level, this is my kind of quick and dirty attack tree. And you know, at a high level, an attack tree really goes through all of the scenarios that an attacker is gonna go through to actually reach their goal of compromising something within the system. Um, so here, you know, I've been using the stride framework to see some of the possible threats that actually live within the Death Star. And some of them, you know, include disabling the ion cannon systems. We can, you know, tamper with the tractor beam. Uh, only if you're a Jedi, you can mind control people to really get into that battle station computer. But also jamming communications, you know, sending signals. Um, there's a lot you can actually do here. And as we all know, if we have all watched Star Wars movies, you know, the security's not that great. So they should have had someone threat model this thing a long time ago. All right, now let's actually kind of go through some of those mitigation strategies from those identified threats. So here, let's talk about a vulnerability. A vulnerability is any system weakness in a system, process, or other entity that could lead to a security being compromised by a threat. A threat really is any action that can disrupt, harm, destroy, or otherwise affect an information system. So here, let's talk about the vulnerability of the thermal exhaust port. This action is exploitation. And exploit means to take advantage of a vulnerability, as we said. In this example, Luke Skywalker ex exploiting the thermal exhaust vent by launching torpedoes into the vent, impacting the core, and triggering a catastrophic explosion is, you know, as we saw how the first Death Star came down. A possible mitigation against this, though, could be to eliminate the two meter wide thermal exhaust port or safeguard this exhaust vent with extra defenses, perimeters, maybe even, you know, a few uh, types of layered approaches so that you can't, you don't have just one gaping hole of a vulnerability right there in the Death Star. Now, let's actually apply the stride framework. So we're gonna go through this in the stride fashion. S stands for spoofing, and this is like kind of fun. Um, but spoofing, you know, it's an authentication property. Spoofing threats involve, you know, an adversary creating and exploiting, or exploiting confusion about who is talking to whom. So in this example, you know, impersonating stormtroopers to hijack communication systems and save princesses is done by Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. And let's face it, it, pretty much every Star Wars movie, you'll see someone impersonating someone. Some mitigations, though, against spoofing could be to authenticate principles such as users or machines by enabling more robust and multiple identity mechanisms such as MFA. Now, T stands for tampering. And this is a property of integrity. Tampering threats involve an adversary modifying data, usually as it flows 
across a network in memory on disk or in databases. In this example, Obi-Wan Kenobi tampering with the tractor beam system to the allow the Millennium Falcon to, to fly to safety. Um, this is that example. A potential uh, mitigation could include adding validation, such as credentials, codes, and safeguards, cameras, guards, you know, limited, limiting the access to this machinery um, could potentially mitigate against tampering. The next one is repudiation where this property is non-repudiation. And you know, repudiation threats, they involve an adversary denying that something happened or claiming to not have performed an action. So in this example, Han Solo saying there's a very dangerous reactor meltdown happening, an attempt to stage a divergence to save the princess. A possible mitigation for this could include ensuring proper observability is in place to track down adversarial behaviors and you know, logging some of those behaviors. The next one is uh, I for information disclosure, and this is the property of confidentiality. Uh, so this is exposing information to someone that is not authorized to see it. In this example, you know, Jin Erso from our favorite movie Rogue One, relying you know critical Death Star vulnerability information to the Rebel Alliance to get that information on the vulnerabilities that lie within the Death Star. A potential mitigation against this could be a thorough understanding of your asset inventory and public exposure are also you know, highly important to help with mitigating against a threat like this. D stands for denial of service and this property is availability. Uh, so to, to deny or degrade services to users. In our example, Chewy is jamming transmission channels for a TIE fighter. And a possible mitigation can include ensuring communication channels are encrypted and only verified users can access these channels. Also, practicing redundancy, such as backup channel availability. And last but not least, E is for escalation of privileges. Um, so this is a property type of authorization uh, where elevation of privilege threats involve an adversary being able to do something or obtain the rights to do things which they do not have uh, you know, access or authorization to do so. Um, in this example, you know, R2-D2 hacking into the Death Star system to open doors and extract information, um, that's, that's a great one because pretty much also every Star Wars movie, you'll see some kind of droid uh, just immediately grabbing information or opening doors. A potential mitigation against this could to be to put checks in place to verify that the appropriate access levels are there for each request and making sure that the person who is, you know, trying to do this certain uh, action has the privilege to do that. And last but not least, you know, continuously iterate and verify. We want to make sure that, you know, sometimes we don't have any of those small openings in any of our systems because that's all that's needed to cause major destruction. All right, and I do have some you know, learning materials here. Um, I could send this deck out to whoever is interested in, and I can also give you some learning materials on how to get started with understanding how to create threat models. Um, if you'd like, you can add me here on LinkedIn. Uh, this is my QR code. You know, send me a message. I'll send you over whatever kind of you know, materials that you're interested in. And that is my talk. Thank you, everyone. May the force be with you. And um, you know, I'll take questions. Uh, I guess I have some time for questions. Uh, if there's any questions here, cool. If not, uh, you know, I can always talk to you guys out there. So thank you guys so much for having me.